I'm Katie and thanks for checking out this message today. We're glad you and your family are here and we would love to get connected with you. One easy way you can do that is text River Connect to 97000. You can also visit our website, therivertrch.cc, to learn more about us and some upcoming events. Lastly, if you would like to give to the River Church today, you can text the amount you want to give to 84321, or you can head to our website and click the Give tab at the top of the page. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope you enjoy today's message. All right, well, we continue this morning in the series that we began last week. We are calling the four most important truths, and that is a big statement to make. But uh, let's do this. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1. That's where we're going to be this morning, 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, and we'll get there in just a second. But we said last week that this month we are talking about God, and we always do. I mean, He is our focus. He is our subject. He is everything but we're sort of really narrowed into who he is, why he does what he does, what he has said in relation to our lives and the suffering that we endure in this life. And uh, we'll talk about this pretty extensively, but um, we said it last week, <clears throat> what we're talking about is him. Uh, the four most important truths are about God. And um, again, I'll say what we said last week, which was this, what you and I believe about God is the most important thing ever. It's the most important thing in our lives. You can think your job is the most important thing. It is not. Uh, It is what you believe about God. That is the most important thing in your life. And what we believe about God is already, please hear me, it is already affecting everything in our lives, everything. Every single thing is impacted by what you believe to be true about God. And so everything you think and everything you do and everything you want and every decision that you make and on and on we could go, every single thing is affected by what you believe to be true about Him. And so this month, who He is is really our focus. Now, as a refresher, the, uh, if you weren't here last week, the four Im- most important truths are these. We looked at this last week. Number one, God is in complete control. And if you haven't heard that, I would encourage you to go back and listen to uh, some of our pastors on that topic. But God is in complete control is truth number one. And then for our purposes this morning, truth number two is all things exist for God's glory. We're going to talk about what that means. And then uh, next week, we'll look at his ways are not our ways. And uh, I don't know, I secretly need to just say thank you to the Lord that that is true, right? His ways are not our ways. Like, aren't you glad I'm not God? (laughs) I'm glad you're not, right? Like, he is not like us, right? But then um, the last week of our series, we will look at how he loves us. Okay, that's the four truths. God's in complete control. All things exist for God's glory. His ways are not our ways. And he loves us. So this morning, all things exist for God's glory. Let's uh, pray. Let's humble ourselves as we must do when we are going to talk about the Lord. Let's, Let's go to him in prayer. Lord, we love you and we need you. We just bow before you. Lord, uh, I pray that this morning you would help us to see you and then to see our right place and to understand what you've said. Lord, that we would just be in the proper position, Lord, as people. Uh, Lord, I pray this morning that you would help us to know you better and to understand you better this morning. We love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, the word glory. (laughs) What do you think of? What comes to mind when you hear the word glory? Most of us would probably point to a sports team winning it all, right? 
some, uh, some of the movies that we've seen kind of capitalize on this idea of glory. You know, the team that makes the incredible transformation and then a remarkable against all odds come back to win it all. Yes, I'm thinking of the Mighty Ducks. And you're welcome, right? You're like, wow, of all the sports movies, you went to Mighty Ducks. Yes, I did. Okay. Uh, right, the glory that sort of ensues, right, in all of it, and, and uh, you know, the, the arena fills with people, and confetti falls, and trophies are given out, and all these things, right? But for me, when I think of the word glory, I think of the fact that I came in second place in this year's March Madness bracket for the River Church, okay? I just need to let, please hold your applause, um, <laughs> Second place, okay? I just want you know, I'm not a sports guy. I just really am not. But um, I picked the team to win, okay? Just, just letting you know. I want it to be clear. I want it to be on the record that everybody knows this. I did not hit the auto-generate button this year, folks. Nope. Like every year I've done for the last six or seven years, okay? This year, somehow I managed to actually pick the two teams that were going to go to the finals, and then I picked the team that would win, and they did. Thank you. Thank you. And listen, I don't even care. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay. But I've been letting everybody know, even though I don't care, I've been letting everybody know because, you know, glory, right? So much glory. No. Listen, the dictionary defines the word glory as high renown or honor won by notable achievements. Okay? It's, uh, in our modern English, it's sort of synonymous with a few other words like renown or prestige or fame or honor or acclaim or accolades. But listen, biblically, the word glory does not just mean acclaim or praise from doing something that is great. Biblically, the word means to recognize something or someone for what it actually is. The Greek word doxa is the word that is used throughout the New Testament. It is translated glory. It's used a lot. The word glory is throughout the Bible over and over and over. But in the New Testament, the word very simply means this. It means to recognize or to think about a person uh, accurately for, for what they actually are. Okay? It's very important. So uh, in short, it means to think correctly about someone. So giving glory to God means you think correctly about him, means that you speak correctly about him. It means that you recognize him for who he actually is. Uh, An example, to say that God is good is to give God glory because that is what God is. He is good. To think of God as holy is also to give God glory because that is what God is. God is holy. But if you take it from the negative... To not glorify God is to think about him in a way that is wrong, to talk about him in a way that is wrong. So for instance, to think that God is okay with sin is to dishonor God, it is to blaspheme him. Because that is not who God is. God is not okay with sin, he cannot be. And to say that he is, is to not recognize him for who he actually is. It is to not glorify him. Does this make sense? So to think that God is evil or to think that God does not care or to think that God is not even there or real or involved, right, is to dishonor God. It is to blaspheme him because it is not who he is. What we're trying to do in this month, I mean, really, we're always trying to do it, but in this month, we are trying to correct any wrong thinking we might have about who God is. Because it, as we said already, it affects everything in our lives. Everything. To glorify God is to think correctly about him, talk correctly about him, and then interact with him accordingly. And when we do this, when we think correctly about God, please hear me, we will have the ability to think correctly about everything else. Please hear that again. This is the reality of what it means. If you don't think about God correctly, I know this is a big statement. If you don't think about God correctly, you don't think about anything else correctly. Nothing. Zero. If you don't think about him the right way, you cannot think correctly about anything else. You cannot. We cannot as people. 
If we don't see him right, we won't see anything else right. Does this make sense? So theology, the topic of who God actually is, the the rubber sort of hits the road, as it were, when we begin to talk about suffering. Okay, All of this begins to really matter when you talk about suffering. Because it's one thing to have ideas about God, but it's a whole other thing when you start to go through the deep and troubling waters of suffering. And then what you believe about God is put into practice. What you believe about the world, what you believe about God's word, what you believe about what God has said begins to flesh out in your life. And all of this really, really matters. So you and I cannot, we cannot correctly process trouble and pain and suffering and loss and difficulty. We cannot properly process those things if we have a wrong view of who God is. Uh, Let me just give it to you this way, some examples. If you have the idea, we said it last week, right, that, that God is some kind of genie in a bottle, that if you just sort of rub that bottle the right way, say the right words, he's going to pop out and give you whatever you want. If you have that idea of God, life, suffering, pain, trouble is going to kick your face in, right? That is what's going to happen. You are going to be severely disappointed. If you have the idea that that God is austere and he isn't personal and he isn't relational and he doesn't really care about you, when trouble comes into your life, it's going to wipe you out. Why? Because you're going to look at it as though God is is not there. It's, It's all meaningless. It doesn't mean anything. If you think wrongly about God, that he's angry with you and he wants trouble and and all and he hates you and all of that, when stuff happens, you're going to process it in the wrong way and think God wants to hurt you. You understand what you and I believe about God is the most important thing. What you think about when you think about God is the most important thing. So we could go on with many examples, but if we think wrongly about God, we will think wrongly about everything else in our lives. And if we took an inventory of the things in our lives that we have had a lot of trouble with, it all stems back to what we believe about God. You flip that around, and if you believe what is true about God, it also impacts everything in your life, okay? If you believe God loves you, guess what? You can process everything that happens in life through that grid, yes? We put those glasses on, we see everything through the lens that God loves me. And so listen, the job doesn't work out, it's okay, God loves me. The job does work out, great, God loves me. Something happens, I know the Lord loves me. Do I have to understand it? Nope. Do I understand it? Nope. But do I know that God is in control? That's true. I do know God is in control. And I don't give up what I know for what I don't know. Some of us are bad at that. We give up what we know in the moment of difficulty for what we don't know. It's so important that you know the truth about who God is, that he is in control. Then you process everything through that grid. Oh man, I don't know where, I don't know how I'm gonna pay my bill this week. God is a provider. God is in control. He loves me. It's gotta work out somehow. You understand how it, how it processes, right? How all of this happens? He's working all things together. Okay, I process that. All, everything through that grid, everything is affected. In the book of 1 Peter, I had you turn there. We're going to be in chapter 1 this morning. The apostle Peter is talking to Christians that are suffering. Okay, and I don't use that word lightly. Okay, they are not suffering in the ways that maybe we sort of in our modern culture would suffer. You know, people making fun of us and maybe we don't get the job promotion or we lose our job because of, you know, whatever. This is very severe. He calls it affliction in chapter 4, verse 13. He calls it abuse in the very next verse. Okay, these people are being afflicted. They are being abused The affliction is coming from non-Christians and also from pseudo-Christians, fake Christians in their lives. 
And uh, what this means is that true followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, they are being chased, they are being imprisoned, they are being beaten, and in many cases, please hear me, they were being killed for their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want you just to try to imagine not knowing if coming here this morning was going to result in, when you went back home today, people are waiting for you to imprison you, to beat you and your children, to potentially kill you. Can you imagine simply gathering as you're doing today, not knowing what it was going to mean? That's the circumstance these Christians are in. Right? I have a, I have a, a cross painted on my front, uh, my front like outer door. It, it faces the street and we did this during COVID, you know, and it was just, it's like painted there. And sometimes I forget that it's there. And the other day I was walking by and I was like, oh, that's, there's a big giant cross on my front window, you know, my front door. And I thought, I don't know if that's like awesome or not, you know, is that like, you know, shoot here first? Or is that like, what is this, right? If you have things, throw them at this house. I don't, you know what I'm, I don't know what it is, right? But it is a witness, right, to the world. But you think about, well, if doing that causes potential harm to my children, right, you start to think through these things. And it's the same thing with these believers. They don't know if uh, someone found out you were doing this. They don't know if they would suffer persecution. But, but Peter is writing to um, and people who now, maybe for the first time in their lives, they are experiencing extreme poverty. And they're experiencing extreme poverty because they have lost their families for following Christ. They've lost their jobs for following Christ. They are marked and no one will hire them. They don't have anything. They're, 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 they're sick. They're starving. They're, they're persecuted. They're hunted. They're killed. Like this is what this is who Peter is writing to. He's writing to people who are living in pain. He's writing to people who are living with loss. He's writing to people living with uncertainty and fear. And I would just ask you to put yourself there because, listen, he's writing to you and I. Okay? So try to imagine now, in the midst of all of that, they get a letter, <laughs> they get a letter from the Apostle Peter. So the church is called together, hey, we have a letter from Peter, and they're, they're called together to hear what the Lord would say through Peter to them. So here's what he says, uh, beginning, we'll pick it up in verse 3, chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a, a living hope. It means a continual hope. How? Well, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Then he says this, verse 4, to an inheritance, an inheritance that is incorruptible, that is undefiled, that does not fade away, it is reserved in heaven for you. I love this. He reminds these suffering Christians, these suffering, wounded, grieving believers who have dealt with such great loss and trouble and heartache, he reminds them this great truth that you and I need to be reminded of this morning, and that's this. You are not home yet. You're not home yet. That's the reminder to them. He doesn't, he doesn't tell them, hey, you know what? It'll be okay. Don't worry. Be happy. You're welcome. Now that song will be the only thing you remember from this morning's message, right? What was the message about? Uh, I don't know. Don't worry. Be happy, right? <laughs> he reminds them. He, does, he, doesn't give them, he doesn't give them that stuff. That, no cotton candy stuff, right? This is substantial. This is real. This is true. He reminds them in the words that he uses that while their jobs can be taken, and he reminds them that while their stuff can be taken, he even reminds them that while their lives can be taken, they have a real home. And it is a real home, a real inheritance that cannot be taken from them. And I would remind you this morning of the very same thing. You who love him, you who know him, you who follow him, 
You who say Jesus Christ is my Savior and Lord, I would remind you that you are not home yet. This is not home. Praise God. God. Listen, I love life. I really do. I'm not itching to die, but this doesn't keep going. And I am so grateful for that. We are not home yet, folks. And you have a home, and it cannot be taken from you. It cannot. Look what Peter's doing, though. What is Peter doing? He's helping them to think correctly about the world, about the Lord, about life, about death, about suffering, about the future. He's trying to help them think correctly because he knows it it affects everything. It affects whether we get out of bed in the morning or not. If we understand that God is in control, if, if I'm not sure that God is in control, listen, I don't get out of bed. You know what I'm saying? It affects everything. And, and so we see this. We see the same thing. Paul did the same thing in Acts 14, um, verse 21. It says that they had preached the gospel to a certain city. They made many disciples, but then they returned. They went back to Lystra and Iconium and Antioch, churches that were suffering. In verse 22, it says that he, they went and they strengthened the souls of the disciples who were there. And you say, well, how did they strengthen their souls We're told, it says, exhorting them to continue in the faith. This is how. You say, how do I even continue? Here's how. They reminded them. Watch this. Here's here's what they didn't say. Don't worry. It'll all be okay. Everything will be fine. You won't have any more trouble. Soon it's going to, you know, it'll it'll all be fixed. Don't worry. Everything's going to be okay. That's not what they said. Here's what they said to strengthen them. They said, we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of heaven. I don't have a message for you that says uh, the rest of this year is going to go perfectly for you. I don't have that. Here's what I have. We, through many tribulations, don't miss the second half, enter the kingdom of heaven. Your inheritance is coming. And this life, you might not have two nickels to rub together. You might be sick your entire life. You might have nothing but pain and trouble and tragedy your entire, you know, 60, 70, 80 years. But this isn't home. And you'll have forever from here on out. Forever. And this is the reminder This is what God is doing. He's telling you, this is what you remind yourselves of. You look past the immediate and to the end. This is how they strengthen the souls of the disciples. After all your suffering, you will enter his kingdom. Listen, um, if you think that this life is all there is, (laughs) that there's nothing more than this, uh, how are you going to live life? You're going to live life like that's true. You're going to be like, man, there's nothing but this. I got to try and get everything I can get out of this. I got to try and do whatever I can do to get whatever I... You're going to live life that way. But listen, if, if you think that, man, how tragic if you think this doesn't end. <laughs> if you believe there's nothing more, that we have, we have to try to get all the happiness from this life. I mean, I want to know how you would deal with suffering and pain and difficulty. It's going to be impossible. And really, the world doesn't know how to deal with pain and suffering and difficulty. Because the way that the world deals with pain and suffering and difficulty is just to try to numb ourselves and distract ourselves and move on. There's no rejoicing in trouble. We know this as believers. Listen, Peter's trying to help them think correctly about God. About his word, about his will, about his plans. And it's not wishful thinking. It's no pie in the sky stuff. He's reminding them of what is true. Anchoring them in truth. Folks, listen, what is true is what matters. Jesus told us that truth is what sets people free. A lot of people, I don't know, I don't, I don't really understand this, but a lot of people would rather believe something that is not true because it's easier. I don't really understand that. If I had cancer, I would rather that the doctor was just straight up and said, listen, man, you have cancer and we got to deal with this thing. I, would, I, I, I don't want him to look at me and say, you know what, that's a really hard message. I'm going to sit with you and say, you know what, you got a cold. It'll work itself out. Stop by the drugstore on the way home, get some NyQuil. You'll be all right. I want truth. 
Jesus said, it's, it's only truth that sets people free. That's what he said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Truth is what sets people free. If you believe true things about God, it is going to change your life in the right ways. But lies imprison people. Their wrong views of God imprison them. Their wrong views of the world imprison them. Their wrong ideas of themselves imprison them. If I believe, as this culture says, that I can do anything I put my mind to and and I just have to want it and I just have to materialize it and I just have to make it happen, if I believe that, I'm going to live life like that and then when when it doesn't happen, I'm going to be destroyed, right? Right? And then I either double down on the stupid lie or I break, right? Truth, ready? Here's truth. You can't do it. Like, I don't like that, but it's true. You don't got it. I don't like that either, but it's true. And guess what happens when you know you don't have it? Guess what happens when you know you can't do it? You look to the Lord, which is what is true. He alone is strong. And when we recognize our weakness, he pours out his strength. It's so important we believe what is true. Consider what's happening here. In the midst of their pain and in the midst of their suffering, the Lord through Peter doesn't just say, hey, oh, it's okay, chin up. He says, don't forget, you're not home. That's what he does. Again, the Apostle Paul did the same thing in Philippians 3.20. He says, our citizenship is in heaven. Not in the United States of America. Not in the world. Your citizenship, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, your citizenship is not here, it's in heaven. That's where you're a citizen. He reminds them, from which we also eagerly wait for our Savior, the Lord Jesus, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body. Can't you wait? I can't even wait. Again, I love life, but man, can I remind you, as Peter reminded him, this isn't going to go on forever. If you know and love the Lord, this is not your home. Your real home, which, by the way, is his home, cannot be taken from you. This life does not go on and on. And all of its trouble is soon going to end. Well, he goes on to say, I know you're hurting. I know you're grieving. I know you're exhausted. But it's not up to you to keep it together. That's what Peter says now. He says, the Lord is the one that's keeping you together. Peter says it, you are being kept, verse 5, you are being kept by the power, the very hand of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Peter says, he is holding on to you. How many of you are grateful that uh, he is holding on to you? Right? Because you lose your car keys, right? (laughs) He doesn't lose you. He will not let you go. In fact, Jesus said in John 17, verse 12, while I was with them in the world, I kept them. I kept them safe. I kept them in your name, he says. Those whom you gave me, I have kept safe, and none of them is lost. Oh, he doesn't lose what is his. Praise God. Oh, oh you, you would give it up, okay? You would lose it. I, I, here's what I know about myself. If the Lord let go of me, I would instantly deny and curse him to his face. It wouldn't even, it wouldn't take a half a second. It wouldn't take a blink. You're like, what? Really? Yeah, his keeping of me is what I trust in, not my ability, not my faithfulness, his. I'm so thankful for God's keeping. And he reminds him of this. He says, he's keeping you. You don't have to keep yourself together. He'll keep you. And then he reminds them, he has saved you and you will be saved. You're being kept by the power of God for a reason, for salvation, it says. Listen, if you know him, he has saved you, okay? And he will save you. Like, what do you mean? Well, he has saved you now and he's going to save you forever. There is no possibility now of you being lost. He does not lose what is his, You who follow him, you who love him, you who want to please him, you will take your last breath here and you will take your first breath there. By the way, so many people are afraid of death, but you know for a believer, your greatest earthly day is going to be the day of your death. He is going to come for you. Please take it. 
I don't know if you've stood by the bed of somebody who knows and loves him, who has gone home to be with him. Please take it from somebody that has stood by the bed of many people going into eternity. Let me tell you something. He always comes to get his people. Always. And sometimes they let me know that he's there. And that is very encouraging. But he always comes. And he always walks us home. And it will be the greatest day of your life when he comes to walk you home. Listen, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You will one day soon close this book with all of its trouble, with all of its pain, with all of its suffering, with all of its loss, and you will open a brand new book. Whole new book. And it's, it's, it's rejoicing forever. And by the way, that is what these reminders have done for them. Look at verse 6, 1 Peter 1, 6. In this, in these truths, watch what it says, you greatly rejoice. Hearing these things, the truth of God's faithfulness, the truth of heaven, the truth of his keeping power, look what it did in them. It caused these suffering Christians, grieving the loss of people they love, it caused them to rejoice. I pray it does the same for you today. The word means to celebrate with, with weeping and joy. I mean, that is true rejoicing, isn't it? All the pain, all the difficulty, finally coming to an end. But listen, one of the, one of the things that causes me to rejoice about heaven is the fact that all those people that I, I know and love that, that have loved him, I'm going to be together with them. I'm going to be together with them. And I can't wait for that. And these, these believers, they're being reminded, hey, don't worry, it's not long now. Don't worry, you'll be together. Don't worry, you'll be with him and you'll be with what is heaven's greatest commodity, which is people. You know you can't take anything to heaven, right? The only thing you can take to heaven with you is people. It's the only thing you can take with you, people. So they're rejoicing now over these things. The reminder of heaven. Verse 6. In this you greatly rejoice, but there's no sugarcoating it. Watch. Though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Have you ever grieved? Uh, it's a word that describes such internal pain that it often cannot even be expressed in words. You ever been there? Words, you can't even describe it. I've been there. It's deep, it's guttural, right? It's, the word means, uh, that, that he uses here means to be afflicted over and over with sadness. Isn't that how grief is? Just being afflicted with sadness. Have you ever grieved? Just it's so deep, right? Grief like this, nothing seems to touch it. You know, the, the, the sun shining outside doesn't seem to be shining. No happy moment seems to override it. No words that anybody says seems to comfort it. It feels like you've got some new layer added to the core of your person, and it is this blanket of grief. It's so hard. These, that's where these Christians are at. They have been grieved like this. The loss of people they love so deeply. They've been grieved by many things, yet they rejoice. And I would ask you, how? How? How do you do that? Do you medicate yourself into oblivion and then try to, try to you know, busy yourself so that you just don't ever think about it again and you hope that 20 years from now you'll be able to smile? That's the only solution the world has. How in the world do you suffer and rejoice? The only way that it's possible to suffer and rejoice is if you know and believe what is true about God. It's the only way it's possible to rejoice in suffering and trouble. It's to think correctly about him and about the end and about the future and about all of it, right? That he is good, that God is in control, that he can only do what is best for us. It's the only way to correctly think about the end of all things, right? Is it, is it all just over? Is it all just over and the person we love, we're never going to see him again? No. That is not true. What is true is that we will see, we will be together. That, that it actually all is coming to an end. 
Thinking rightly about this life, that it's temporary. Thinking rightly about heaven, that heaven is a real place for real people. Or as my pastor used to say, heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. Listen, you can only rejoice if these things are actually true. And folks, they are actually true. Not because I make them true, not because I say they're true, but because God does. Listen, as we suffer and think correctly about God, we bring him glory. Okay? We bring him glory. To think rightly about him results in you talking rightly about him. This results in you pointing others to him, right? And, and, and rightly to him. And, and it, but here's the thing. If you don't think correctly about God, if you think God is evil or he doesn't exist or whatever, you're never going to point anybody to him. You're never going to glorify God. But as we go through difficulty and pain and loss in life, and we think rightly about God, we bring glory to the Lord. It's awesome. This is what Peter says now at the end of verse 7. He says uh, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, watch this, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation, the revealing of Jesus Christ. Did you catch that? Your suffering, Peter said, your suffering, our loss, can bring glory to the Lord Jesus at his coming. Have you ever thought about your trouble that way? That it brings glory, it it causes people to recognize him, causes people to see him, and and to celebrate who he actually is at his appearing. Your suffering, how good and faithful God has been to you, you're gonna declare this, God, you've been there, you've been faithful, you've seen it all, you've helped me, you've counseled me, you've been everything for me, is gonna give glory to the Lord at his appearing. This is what Peter is telling them. You say, how do we bring glory to the Lord at his appearing? By the way we go through suffering now. The way we go through suffering now, it it can, it's supposed to, it's supposed to point us to him. It's supposed to drive us deep into him, not away from him, deep into him. That's what he wants. But also, listen, our suffering points the people around us to him. It can actually help people recognize him. Do you realize this? Your pain Causing people to see him, to glorify him for the first time. Folks, I've seen this in so many of your lives, it's crazy. If I went through just this side of the room, you know, just talked about how I've seen you trust him in the middle of what you don't understand, in the middle of of what you hate, in the middle of what is so hard to deal with and carry and move through. I've watched this in your lives. I've watched you in the hospital affecting everybody around you. Though you're in pain, though you don't understand what's going on, though you don't know how to fix it, I've watched you point to the Lord Jesus throughout all of it, and I've watched people glorify the Lord because of you. In your confusion, in your frustration, In in your pain, in your suffering, I've watched you give glory to the Lord. And people have recognized him. I've watched this. The way you go through trouble. You don't understand why. I don't understand why. We don't want it. I don't want pain. I don't want trouble. I don't want suffering. I wish it was over. I wish the pain, the sorrow, all of that was over. But listen, you trust him. And you love him. And you stay. Job, at the end of all of his suffering and pain, the loss of everything he had, including all of his children, it's unthinkable. Job says this in Job 13, 15. He says, though the Lord slay me, yet will I trust him. You tell me how someone says that. I I tried to process that through the grid of my kids I cannot process that through the grid of my kids. I just, I, it's like I can't do it. This man lost everything and says, though the Lord slay me, yet will I trust him. How can a person say that? The only way they can say it is if you believe what is true about God, that he is good, 
that he loves us, that he can only do what is good for us, that he is in control, that heaven is real. I mean, that's the only way you're going to rejoice. That's the only way you're going to be able to say that. As you suffer in this life, this is what happens. People see, they see, and they begin to understand who he is through you. And that's what Jesus said, didn't he? Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. And watch this, glorify, recognize, not you, recognize God. Recognize your Father who is in heaven. Folks, the good work that we do is not the fish sticker on the back of our car. It's not the cross necklace around our neck. That's not a bad thing, okay? It's your trust in Him in the midst of loss. That's the, that's the good work that people don't understand. The good work is not that you have all these things and, man, you're hashtag blessed, you know. That's not the good work of God. The good work is your love for him in the middle of pain and confusion and tragedy and difficulty. It's your confidence in him when you absolutely have no idea what's going on and how to stop anything and how to fix anything and nothing makes any sense and you don't know what's up and what's down or anything else. You have no idea how it all wires together. But at the end of it, you say, though he slay me, yet will I trust him because he's worthy to be trusted, because he's good, because he's right, because he cannot do evil, because he's in control, because heaven is real, because he's with me, because he loves me, because he exists. This is how lost people recognize him through you. Folks, this is how all things exist for his glory, because everything in our lives can point to him. Every good thing is designed to do this. We know that from James. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights with whom there's no variation or shadow of turning. We know that. Every good thing points to him, but I think even more powerfully, every hard thing, every painful thing. I mean, it seems easy almost to celebrate when the new car or the whatever, that seems almost easy. Like, oh yeah, but man, it doesn't make sense when you're rejoicing in the midst of getting your head kicked in. Every painful thing, every difficult thing, and still pointing to him, it helps people recognize who he is. It's how we give him glory. So when we say that, all things exist for God's glory, that's what we mean. We mean all things can point to him. I lose my job, it's okay, God's good. I get a new job, praise the Lord, God is good. He's faithful and he provides. This job is terrible, that's okay, God is good, I love him, right? I mean, just take anything you want. Just pass it right through that grid. I don't know how to pay this bill. That's okay. God is in control. God is not limited. He can do anything. Well, but I don't know where it's going to come from, so it must be coming from God. Oh, but how do you know God loves you? How do you know God even wants to help you? Because I know these things, right? God has said these things, so I'm sure God's going to come through. It affects everything. Everything in our lives is affected. Please understand as we close that the goal of the Lord is is to reveal himself. He is not trying to hide himself from anybody. He wants to make himself known. This is what he does. And so listen, he does this in all of our lives so that we make him known in all of our lives so that people that don't know him will come to know who he actually is and glorify him. They'll recognize him. Folks, our entire lives as Christians can bring him glory can cause people to recognize him for who he actually is. So I just want to close with four verses. I just want to read them to you. Okay? 1 Corinthians 10.31 tells us, Therefore, whether you eat or you drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Do everything you do so that people see him. So people see him. Colossians 3.23, similarly, whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. What a beautiful thing. 1 Corinthians 6.20, you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. Listen, use your life to make him known. Use your life to make him known. That's the point. Romans 11.36, for of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. 
Amen. You realize heaven will be a place where we finally see him for all that he is, and we will get to celebrate that forever and ever. What a blessing that will be. Man, God is so good. Maybe you sit here today and you don't actually know the Lord and you'd like to know how to actually be saved. Acts 3.19 tells you it is to repent, therefore, and be converted, be saved, that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. The only way, the only way, and I'm thankful there is a way, but the only way to be saved is to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ in repentance of sin and believing. We repent of sin, which means we feel sorry for sin, we turn to God in our sorrow. We ask for his forgiveness, but it also is belief. We believe that we are sinners. We believe we cannot save ourselves. We believe Jesus Christ is the Savior and that he came and he died on that cross to save us from our sin. That is what we must believe. The Bible says if we will, God will save us. So let's pray together. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your mercy and your kindness and your love for us. We thank you, Lord, that you truly are good I pray, Lord, that um, you would use your word today to shape our minds and hearts and to help us see you correctly. Lord, I pray for any person watching or any person sitting here today that does not yet know you. I pray they would turn to you in repentance and in belief. That, Lord, they would be saved, that their sins would be washed away. Lord, I pray for that. I pray they would turn to you now. And if that's you, if you can hear the Lord just pulling at you, just turn to him now. Respond in repentance and in belief. Lord, we love you. We give you our hearts. We give you our lives. We trust you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.